from the room after surviving the Obama administration. Um, he is, uh, he recently founded Allidaid, which is helping primary care doctors form ACOs. And if anybody needs help, it's primary care doctors, I would say. So please welcome Dr. Mr. Shari. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, uh, it was actually an incredible privilege to serve in the administration. Um, uh, there was, uh, though, of course, uh, some challenges. One of them was, my first time I wanted to give a, a talk, they said, okay, so we'll need your slides cleared two weeks before, which is a challenge for me. So I said, well, what if I don't have slides? And they said, well, then you're okay. And I said, okay, I don't have slides. So I haven't had slides for about five years now. Um, but today, I actually, I wish we did have one slide. So I'm going to beg your uh, uh, forgiveness. I'd like you to imagine, or if you have a piece of paper, you can create this slide for yourself to take home. Three concentric circles, not concentric, three intersecting circles, OK? A Venn diagram. One circle says, good for society. The other circle says, good for patients. And then a third circle, and this I realize there may be some controversy over, says, good for doctors. And I'm going to talk today through the prism of those three goods. Is it good for society? Is it good for patients? And is it good for doctors? And I'll argue that if we actually want to have health reform that lasts, we need to hit that triple shot. It's not going to be enough for it to be only good for society, or only good for patients, controversially, or only good for doctors. It's got to be good for all three. So let me do it in a way by way of saying what it's not, right? So we have fee-for-service medicine. This was really good for doctors. I uh, recently talked with Sandeep Johar. Anyone read his book, Doctored? I really recommend everyone to read this book. And it's on Amazon Unlimited, so it's, you can get it for free. And it is a searing indictment of fee-for-service medicine. And he points the finger at himself and other doctors, right? Who basically, he says, in the 1940s, the average inflation-adjusted income for a doctor was $50,000 a year. You did not go into medicine. You had status, there was, right? But you didn't go into medicine expecting to be wealthy at all. $50,000 a year inflation adjusted was the income. And then in the 70s, something happened, right? which was fee-for-service medicine, mostly people not, no longer having to pay out of pocket, a combination with insurance. And doctors' incomes soared, absolutely soared except for primary care. And what we're seeing now is a generation of providers whose expectations were set in terms of what kind of income they should expect. And we see, as he terms it, operatic self-pity among urologists who are making now $650,000 a year instead of the $800,000 they expected. And that fee-for-service system obviously has, at the one side, clearly bad for our society in terms of rising healthcare costs. It is the clear culprit in terms of how much healthcare costs are going up, and we can't afford it anymore. But in his book, he also makes clear how it's bad for patients, too. When it's getting to such a pitch, the churning and back scratching, and you refer to me and I'll refer to you, right? And no 
You know, no diagnosis, diagnosis goes untested. And unnecessary scans and unnecessary hospitalizations, unnecessary infections that are caused by a fee-for-service system run amok. This was the system that Atul Gawande described in 2009 in his Cost Conundrum article that really did become required reading in the White House. This is before the Affordable Care Act, where he described a culture of, as the picture showed, the patient being treated like an ATM. The patient becomes, as in the words of Dr. Johar's brother, a commodity. Think about that. The patient becomes a commodity. So fee for service, you know, good for doctors. At least it was. Maybe initially good for patients because more is better. We get more. I get more of everything, right? But then it begins to really go over that starling curve of too much. And initially society could afford it, but we can't afford it anymore. So now we're saying, how do we get out of this? And the biggest drivers for this, moving away from C free for service, are not doctors. 7% of physicians enthusiastically agreed that we need to move away from fee for service. Fee for service been good to me. <laughs> and it's not really patience. Despite everything that policy people say in a room, right? My mom still says, I'm in an ACO. Does that mean they're not going to give me the good expensive stuff anymore? People still equate cost with quality, even in healthcare, where the abundance evidence is it's unrelated. But society is saying, we got to move away from this. Right? We cannot afford this. Businesses can't afford it. The federal government can't afford it. State governments can't afford it. And as a matter of policy, right, the people who are supposed to be minding the policy house, Congress and the regulators, say, we've got to move away from fee-for-service. Who else is saying we've got to move away from fee-for-service? There was a great announcement today from the Catalyst for Healthcare Reform, right? the, what I would call the other conference going on today in Berkeley, where they announced results of, and this is mostly a purchaser group. These are companies who are saying, no more. We got to move away from this fee-for-service business. Now, here's the interesting thing. They set their goal to get to 20% other than fee-for-service by 2020. Because that's how fast healthcare moves. An ambitious goal. We're going to be 20% other than fee-for-service by 2020. And last year, we were at 9 point, whatever, 10.1% was everything else. What is it this year? Anyone see that clip? No, it didn't go from 10 to 11. We did a little better than that. What was it? Guess. 13. Do I hear 15? 20. Do I hear 20? 25, 30, 35, 40%. That is stunning. That is shocking. 40% in their latest survey of commercial health plans of their payment is tied to something other than pure fee-for-service volume. From 10% to 40% in one year. That is stunning. That's almost as fast as EHR adoption. So what's the alternatives? What are the alternatives to this do more, bill more, right? Get paid more system. We tried one, remember? Anyone here remember, right, 20 years ago? 
right? There was managed care. We tried that. What happened? Good for society. Was it good for society? Did it help control healthcare costs for a while? Yeah, it did. Overall, you know, improvements it was there. You know, were people dying in droves? No. Right. Was it good for docs? No. Not too good for docs, right? Because often came with closed networks and cost controls. But here's what killed it. It wasn't that it wasn't good for docs. What killed it was the patient side, where people felt that their care was taking second place to cost control. That stinting, right? If the only thing that matters, and if the only way you can control costs is by not giving me that referral that I actually need, right? If we fail this test, the patient test, we may be able to do it for a while, but the backlash will kill that reform, as it did with managed care. So if it's good for docs, but not society, there will be a correction. If it's good for society, but not good for patients, there will be a correction. And now here comes the confessional section of our evening's program. We tried something else too. In 2009, um, we said, ah, we know how to improve healthcare for society and for patients, right? We'll embed population health into every electronic health record. We'll make every patient be able to access their own health information and tap into this amazing world now, mobile and cloud. Get your data and do whatever you want with it, right? And there was this real revolution in terms of success, right? In terms of getting the tools in the hands of people who by and large weren't paid for population health or patient engagement for that matter. So good for society test, I would argue yes. Maybe some of you would argue no. Good for patients, I would argue yes. Maybe some of you would argue no. But the good for doctors part, unless you're one of the doctors who really finds your satisfaction in taking care of the population of patients and having your patients be empowered or whatever, and there are some of those amazing people, but from an income point of view, if the only way you make money is by squeezing more and more visits into shorter and shorter time, what you hear is, don't slow me down. And this is slowing me down, right? Giving the patient a portal access thing, don't slow me down. Why am I doing this? I don't get paid for this. Collecting information about their medications so you can do medication reconciliation, why? It's probably fine, I'm really quick at this. I'm really, I've trained 20 years to be really quick at this. No one can read my handwriting or my signature, but I'm really good at it. Make a list of patients, why? Why do I have to make a list of my patients? I have my list of patients who are gonna see me today, right there on the schedule. Yes, they're only 1% of my patients. No, I don't know what's happening with the other 99%. But that's not what I get paid for. I get paid for the 20 people who I'm going to see today, and I'm going to try to make it 25 people, and then 30 people, and then 35 people. The highest I've seen is 60. OK? So good for society, maybe good for patients, maybe good for docs. No, it doesn't work. So let me take you. Remember we talked about McAllen, Texas, and the cost conundrum, the Tool Gawandi article in 2009? Bob Kocher and I recently wrote a New York Times op-ed, what happened in McAllen, Texas five years later? And this is the promise part of the promise and peril of accountable care. What happened in McAllen, Texas five years later? I, I called up, I was at Brookings at the time, called and calling all the different ACOs around the country. How are you doing? What are you doing? What are you finding? 
18 primary care doctors, 18 of them, said, wait a minute, it's Medicare Shared Savings Program, wait a minute, I'm like this much of healthcare costs. However much I churn, I'm still, I don't do procedures, right? There's an upper limit to how much I can make. 95% of these Medicare costs, which in McAllen, Texas was 14 to $16,000 a year per Medicare beneficiary. Think about that for a second. Right? They said, wait a minute, I'm only a tiny sliver of these costs. Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that if I reduce all of that, I get to keep half of it? Now, wait a minute, I get to keep 60% of it if I'm willing to bet that costs aren't gonna go higher? And they said, yeah, give me that deal. So they said, we're all in. They were one of four groups, I think, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, who said, we'll take two-sided risk. And Dr. Penelope said, if we, if costs went up, we would have to take it out of our pockets. And we didn't have it. All right, so think about that mindset when this group of 18 primary care docs says, I've got to make this work. I've got to have better quality and lower cost for this group of patients. What is the behavior that that induced? Was it good for society? Was it good for patients? And was it good for the doctors? Let me first talk about, was it good for society? Those 18 primary care physicians on 8,500 Medicare patients saved $20 million in one year. Let me say that again so you can do the math. <laughs> 18 primary care physicians in independent practice, 13 independent practices with seven or eight different EHRs, 18 of them. Right, this front row here saved Medicare $20 million in one year. Taxpayer got to keep 8 million of that. Their ECO got $12 million. 18 primary care physicians have never seen $12 million. Was it good for patients? How'd they do it? Did they start saying, no A1C for you? <laughs> I've actually had primary care docs say to me, if I join an ACO, will I have to stop ordering A1C tests? And I said, that's so sweet. That costs $7. <laughs> right? Because they can only see the costs that they see. But once they became an ACL, they got the claims for everything. And he said, it was like we could see for the first time where all the money was going. And he said, the number one thing we worked on was what? Hospitalizations. Some of you might say, Oh, but according to the recent National Healthcare Expenditures Report, only 32% of total costs are hospitalizations, right? And he said, yeah, but that hospitalization then triggers a whole sequence of follow-on events. One out of three Medicare patients gets a complication when they're in the hospital. Then there's the post-acute costs. Then there's the home care. Then the patient gets caught in these mills, at least in McAllen they did. To keep them out of the hospital in the first place. How did they keep them out of the hospital? How do you keep a patient out of a hospital, a primary care patient, a poor, one of the poorest counties in the country, patient who doesn't speak English mostly, who has a very low educational level, who has one of the highest rates of diabetes in the country? How do you keep them out of the emergency room? How did RGV ACO keep them out of the emergency room? Here's what they did. Do you have a cell phone? In the visit with the patient, they took out their flip phone. 
not a fancy smartphone app. Check out the flip phone, and here is the intervention. Beep, boop, 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 boop. Hit call. The patient hits call, and the doctor's phone rings. And the doctor says, OK, that's how you reach me. See? You put that call button. I programmed it in your phone, and I want you to call me. Some of you say, oh, that's concierge medicine. It turns out you want to save money for the healthcare system, do concierge primary care. Is it good for the patient? Hell yeah. How did they save money? They gave more access to their patients. They had people calling the patient and saying, what did the doctor say? Let me translate it for you. The doctor spoke Spanish, but the, they had someone calling the patient to translate the medical discussion into layperson's discussion for them. Some patients they called every week. How do they know which patients to call? Because you can't do it for every patient. You can't do it for 8,500 patients. That's not cost effective. That's also known as disease management. A little joke. How do they know who to call? Where did they get the data from? Uh-uh. Those electronic health records. They got the data out of their electronic health records, and they analyzed it to find out who the patient's most at risk. And they really focused on those patients. They improved their diabetes D5 score to levels previously only seen in Minnesota. Another little joke. So here's this little ACO that can. And I was talking to a journalist, and they said, uh, this is really all the things you're saying is really, really interesting. What hospital were they a part of? And I said, oh, no, you see, they weren't. Because how did they get the savings? They were completely unfettered in how they went about getting the savings. They weren't trying to do this with one arm tied behind their back, which is, Get savings, but just let us know about this demand destruction side, <laughs> right? Don't go too hard, too fast, right? I want some predictability. We don't want to drop our bed count too quickly. Oh, but we're trying to get those specialists. Oh, and there's facilities fees associated with that. And we just built this proton beam, right? So these were 18 independent primary care docs came together and they did something that was in their interests, financial as well as professional. And this is important, because if you only feed the financial beast, I don't think it works for doctors long-term. I think they get, they feel like they're feeding the financial beast by doing things that are not actually good for the patient or for society, less so, but mostly for the patient, they get bitter. And we have a lot of bitter doctors in this country. They blame all sorts of things, right? And you can say, oh, it's that Obamacare. That's why doctors are so unhappy today. Except that in 2008, 6% of doctors described their morale as being very positive. 2008. So it's not Obamacare. And it's not meaningful use either. There's a dissonance between doing what you have to do to make a living and doing what you went in to be your life. And doctors are feeling that today. So RGV ACO, good for doctors, hell yeah. Good for society, hell yeah. Good for patients, hell yeah. Triple shot. So how do we get more of those? What's the peril part of the promise and peril? I guess I would say you can't fail the patient, you can't fail society, and you can't fail the docs. So first is you can't fail the patient. The big risk in these models is it becomes managed care warmed over. 
The big risk of these models is you get some people doing stupid things. Some people trying to say we can do some quick wins on stinting on needed care. That's the risk. I haven't seen it. I've talked to, I don't know, 50 ACOs and asked them, what are you doing? How are you doing it, right? I haven't seen one that I believe. I've seen plenty who are doing nothing. <laughs> plenty who are really are going to, if they succeed, it's pure luck, right? Plenty of those. But I actually haven't seen many. And this is partly, I think, because of how the rules are designed. Who are saying, yeah, I'm going to save a lot of money by stinting on needed care for patients. And some of those things that a lot of provider ACOs are railing against as bugs in the program, from a policymaker perspective, were not bugs, they were features. So we heard in the past session, you know, patient attribution is a problem. Right? Once, a, you know, you should have me have the patient just like we do in MA. How many times have people heard that? Right? The ACO program, we can't succeed unless it's just like MA. And it's missing the point that from a policymaker perspective, it can't be just like MA because we have MA. MA is for the people who chose MA. ACOs are for the 60, 70% of Medicare fee-for-service patients who have chosen not to be in managed care. Hello? Right? If they wanted to be in a Medicare Advantage plan, they would have signed up for a Medicare Advantage plan. Right? They chose not to. So whatever we do to help address the attribution issue, and I believe it's an issue, we can't create a situation where it goes against patient choice. So if you say to me, the ACO rules should be modified so that a patient can opt into durable attribution to an ACO, I say, fantastic. Why? It's patient choice. It's the principle of patient choice. If you also say to me, if a patient doesn't want to be in an ACO, like my mom, right? If she says, as I don't want my doctor's care of me to be influenced at all by trying to save money on me. Now, let's put aside for the moment that doctor's care of her is influenced by them making money off of her, right? But if she says that and she says, I don't want my data shared with this ACO for whatever reason, she should also be able to say, I don't want to be in this ACO. That would help attribution predictability, right? But it works because of why it's patient choice. We're not going against patient choice. And that's one of the things that I worry about. How could this fail if we get some people getting greedy, doing stupid things that helps create a backlash against this movement? Haven't seen it yet, but you know, our capacity to do stupid things is large. There's also quality measures that I think more quality measures need to be around making guarding against this. The other thing that our, my other provider ACO friends say is too many quality measures. Just focus on the, if I'm reducing costs, that's good. Why are you, why are you, get all this burden of data collection and checking all these quality measures on me and the patient survey, right? And they fail to understand the policy reason behind that, which is we can't make it just about saving money like we did before, because we tried that once and it failed because patients felt like they were just getting less, not better quality, just less. We can't do that again. So we have to have quality measures that ask the patient, how easy is it for you to see a specialist? We have to have quality measures that say, how good is this ACO at delivering preventive care? We have to have measures that look at ambulatory care sensitive admissions. Ambulatory care sensitive, so you're not stinting on the need of care. All right, so that's the first peril. The second peril is if we fail society. If we actually don't get savings, 
it's kind of obvious, but a lot of people were counting things on the basis of how many lives or how many dollars in shared risk contracts. That is a short-term metric, folks. <laughs> the real metric is how many dollars saved. So when you hear the survey results, fantastic, 40% are at risk contracts, right? How much money was paid out in shared savings? Less than 1%. Less than 1%. So if we do all this and we get no net, no right, random distribution, some people do really well, some people do really poorly, right? We get that and we continue to get that. You get that the first time, that's fine, right? Because that's just experimentation. But then the people who do this, like, should continue to grow, and the people who do this should leave, right? That, like, natural selection doesn't work if there's no one selected. So if we don't get that, and that's part of the reasons why their CMS is saying we need two-sided risk. You need to move on to two-sided risk. What does two-sided risk say? Two-sided risk says, if you're in this end of the thing, get the hell out, right? You're not doing a good job. Get out. So why would someone be in a program if they don't really think they're going to get savings? Why would someone form an ACO if they really weren't committed to getting shared savings? Oh, that's a good one. I hope so. Reputation. All right, what else? Sense of inevitability, who you buddy up, who can you buddy up with? What else? Less administrative hassle. Not in my experience. There are some exemptions, right? We heard about the Stark and anti kickback exemption, right? Which is where I'm kind of headed. Why would people join ACOs if they really weren't banking on shared savings? It's a better model of care, even if you're not really doing anything and getting any shared savings. I'm a cynic. No, no, no. The, the, there were 35 who got advanced payments. That's done. Hmm. That's a good one. So remember I said RGVACO got claims data for every single claim paid on their patients, including the ones for other people? So that's kind of nice information to have about your patients and who else they're seeing, right? And maybe I can increase my ISU, in-service utilization, which is the other flip side of the, this really clinically ugly word, leakage. I'm going to clamp down on leakage. Yeah. Market power. Ding, 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 ding. Market power. So what happens when you get consolidation, not of the Idaho two big hospital systems or a big hospital system, a big provider group form and create a monopoly and the Federal Trade Commission and Marty Gaynor says, hey, that's interesting. What about the kind of market power that comes with the Pac-Man consolidation? Right? I can't make the sound. <laughs> right? Where you start to clear, create these clinically integrated networks and you start to bring more and more people in and you say, hey, we're doing an ACO, you got to join. You got to buddy up with somebody. Buddy up with me. Right? I'm getting the data. Why are you sending your stuff away? We're farm we friends. Right? And you get more market power. And then what do you do with that market power? What does anyone do with market power? Why is it called power? Higher prices. Is that good for society? No. It's good for patients. How integrated is clinically integrated? I can do this because I trained there. What's partners? A one word oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Mass General and the Brigham have yet to merge a single clinical department. They haven't merged a single clinical, but they, they're partners, partners in health plan negotiations. <laughs> so that's the second risk, is uh, that we don't enforce failure. If you're not able to make this thing work, like get out. Let the people, the docs, primary care docs, whoever, right? Let them join other ACOs who are actually doing something. Don't be a blocker. And there's a third way that we can fail, which is failing doctors. And again, I said this is maybe a little controversial because a lot of people say, you know, why are we putting so much importance on the doctors? Is it because you're a doctor? Right. You know, this isn't healthcare now about your iPhone and your team and there's the pharmacist, there's Hensley, right? There's all these other things like, why are we saying, why are you putting so much focus on the doctor? And I'm not being ideological, I think I'm just being um, a realist here. That unless the physicians who are making the decisions with their pen, right? Voting with their feet, what model to embrace or not embrace, unless they can get on board with something like this, it's not gonna, it's not gonna last. Soon after joining the administration, just a little story, soon after joining the administration, I think it was maybe my first or second, you know, all politicals meeting. Deputy secretary's there, the head of CMS, all the different agency heads are there. And it was around equalizing pay between cardiologists and internists. Anyone remember this? 2009. And they'd done some study and they'd found we pay cardiologists too much and primary care docs too little. And let's, you know, pay primary care a little bit more and cardiologists a little less. What happened? Like every member of Congress who had a heart <laughs> or was worried that they might one day have a heart wrote in and were like, what the heck are you doing? My cardiologist is very upset. So it's got to be okay for the docs too. And what happens if we have ACOs where they're savings, but the docs don't get to see any of that? How are they going to get the savings? They're going to go around the docs, or maybe they're going to micromanage the docs. Yes, we'll use all this technology we have and the incentives we have to micromanage more. We'll do, some one guy said to me, we can't UM the patients anymore, so let's just UM the docs. Now for the, those of you who didn't laugh, UM is utilization manage. Yeah. We can't to UM, like what a verb. We can't UM the patients anymore, so we'll UM the docs, right? I just don't think that's gonna last. So the providers who are the ones who we really wanna change how they're practicing medicine, we want them to take that call on two in the morning. Think about that. We want them to take that extra time with the patient and their family members. They've got to see what's good for them in this. So the big risk here is that you don't get 18 doctors back to where we started in Rio Grande Valley who feel like they can actually do this because this isn't easy. It's not what they were trained to do. And those Rio Grande Valley and Palm Beach ACO and a few others, right, they're exceptions to the rule that most of the Medicare Shared Savings Program year one ACOs have not shown savings. So they've put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in, a lot of their own money in, in many cases. Money they, primary care docs, really can't afford. <laughs> right? it's, not, it's, not, it's not there. And they haven't been able to get savings. So we can't fail them in that. We need to offer them, make it a little bit easier for them to succeed, whether it's more upfront capital, whether CMS does it or the private equity markets do it, whether it's tools that actually work to help them 
identify their high-risk patients and reach out to them and manage care in a different way that doesn't just look at your top 20 people on your calendar, but also says, who are the top 20 people who are not on my schedule today, who I need to see? Whether it's technical assistance and someone who can go actually in the practice, not some website, not an app, but someone who can be in the practice to coach them, to help them with this practice transformation. Ideally, putting all three of those together into kind of an easy button. That's what I'm trying to do. There's a lot room for a lot more people to try to do that. But I don't think we can let the doctors fail, the patients fail, or let society fail on this. Thank you. We got a few minutes for questions. Yes. Can you comment on uh, the ACA thing of um, patient picking the ACA? Um, yeah. You want to pick sick patients. So um, the, the way it works is you look at your bed, benchmark baseline costs over the previous three years uh, and 60%, 30%, 10%. And uh, there's a risk adjustment that goes along with that. So the sicker your patients start out with, the higher the costs at baseline, the more of an opportunity to make a savings. If you have a group full of healthy people with you know, basically very low healthcare spending, it's tougher to squeeze that down. So there are pro, you know, anti-cream, I don't forget what the word would be, but like uh, the way these programs typically are structured, it makes it worthwhile to try to find populations and physicians who care for pretty sick populations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people, uh, when I was at Brookings, we wrote a policy piece, and, and the way we characterized this was, what happens in year four, right? Because the first three years, your benchmark is set, and it, it will only be adjusted based on your patient getting older. Medicare costs national, nationwide usually go up, although sometimes not, uh, and the risk of your, of your patients. But after three years, right, so if you reduce total health care costs from – say $14,000 to $12,000 in the first year. And even if you just stay at $12,000, right? Zoop, you get paid you know, $12 million, $12 million, $12 million. But then what happens in year four? Does it go all the way down here? Does it slowly go? Does it inflation, local factors? Do you, are you, do you get compared to your fee-for-service controls in the same area? We don't know is the answer. We'll see what the new rules come out for Medicare say about that. Different health plans have different approaches to this. But I guess my good for society, good for patients, good for doctors view on this is that we have really smart people at CMS, and they're not going to want to kill the goose, geese that lay golden eggs. Yeah. Well, they are. They are. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I'm going to take a slightly contrarian view. I think you should. Like I didn't? No, you didn't. Uh, I did not go to school in Boston. I'm not a doctor. I have nothing to do with um, the bastion of liberalism. Uh, but I think one thing, I just uh, as a joke, I think you should rename your topic the evil of fee for service and the evil of specialization. Maybe <coughs> one way to change the model would be that we don't have specialists, we only have everybody as an internist or a pediatrician, then you don't have this change in terms of uh, compensation, the huge disparity in compensation. But really, the, the question that I want to ask, and I know everybody here and I do also appreciate and agree with everything that you say, but taking a contrarian view, I want to ask you this. When I look at other industry, the financial industry, the uh, retail industry, all of these other industries, we have challenges in those as well. But is there a point at which regulation becomes truly so cumbersome that it really puts... I think the word you're looking for is job killing. True. 
Exactly. And, and because we never talk about it when we talk yeah, about yeah, healthcare. Yeah. Here's, here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. Um, someone said to me uh, uh, recently, um, why do you think the US approach to health IT increased adoption so much? And the UK or other approaches didn't. Don't, don't you think we're headed, you know, towards towards that model? And I said, I think the, the big uh, difference was we created a market force. And yes, there were some regulations to set the rules of the playing field, but fundamentally it was a market-based approach. And it tapped into what's really good about America's vitality of capitalism, right? If you set the rules of the game in such a way that the market forces get you towards your societal benefit goal. Right? That to me is the highest, best form of government and regulatory action. And in this instance with ACOs, I believe that the regulations have created a playing field where in which competing fiercely with market forces like the folks you know, in RGV and the folks in Palm Beach and others competing within the new rules of the market yield societal benefit as well as self-interest and professional benefit. So, um, I think we can argue about whether all of the regulate, regulatory requirements there are necessary for patient protection, to protect against stinting, to make sure that we're getting quality and cost, to make sure, right? And surely they are burdensome, right? You have to get mother may I permission from CMS in any communication you send to a patient. Now, on the other hand, they said, if we don't respond to you within seven or 10 days, go ahead and send it. All right, so part of this is understanding what the regulatory parameters are and not exaggerating them. I know you see I'm sitting next to you, the former chief privacy officer for ONC and maybe for, uh, for the country uh, for a while. And she made a point of saying, you know, HIPAA, everyone says like, oh, HIPAA doesn't let me, can't do this, right? It's because mostly people who don't understand what HIPAA actually said and what it actually permits and it requires not just what it bars. So I think there is a little bit too much, I think, sometimes, of the people being afraid, and particularly West Coast people, being afraid of what regulations are or aren't. And I can't go into, I can't do innovation in healthcare because of the regulations, right? And if you want to transform healthcare, but you don't want to get involved in regulations, you know, go build cat apps. Thank you so much.